the business community is quite concerned about. Um, just to give you a little bit of context about why we think it's important, uh, kids today need at least two years of post-secondary education or training. And of course in Tulsa we are very fortunate because with concurrent enrollment and career tech, you can get some of that before you finish high school if you plan ahead. But kids today need at least two years of some kind of post-high school credential, whether it's a career tech certification, an associate's degree or a baccalaureate degree, in order to get a job that is sustainable. If they don't finish high school, they're going to be poor. If they don't finish high school, they're three times as likely to be unemployed. Right now in Tulsa, we have thousands of jobs, literally, open in the manufacturing industry. But we have a lot of people who can't find work. And a lot of people say to people like me, you know, you're with the chamber, you ought to know. What's the problem? I can tell you what the problem is. The people who are out of work either have no skills or the wrong skills. The jobs that are open are highly technical. They require some highly technical skills, whether it's something like a CNC machinist, um, an advanced welder, an airframe power mechanic, or whether it's an IT person, and that could be somebody with a certificate, a social degree, or a bachelor, a computer programmer, we're short on accountants, um, we're short on everything in healthcare, you name it, we're short. So we have jobs open, and we have people who need to fill them, but they don't have the educational skills to take advantage of the training programs or go to Tulsa Community College. So we've got a real problem. We also know that demographically, the generations coming into the workforce are smaller than the generations that are leaving. The baby boomers are going to cause us a real problem as they retire because there aren't enough people to replace them. They also are the highest, most highly educated generation in American history. If you look at the statistics, the generations that follow are not as highly educated. And this is in a time when the economy wants more education, not less. So what happens to kids? don't finish high school. It's really a dismal future. Um, and we as a community, and, um, and I'm so glad that we've got multiple school districts here because this is really a national and state problem. It is not one district or one neighborhood. We've all got a problem. We've got far too many kids who for lots of reasons um, don't finish high school and then aren't prepared to go on for that next level of training so they can support themselves and their families. So for us, it's an economic issue. For the community, it's a social issue. And I hope that all of us together, because it is not something that the schools can solve alone. We know that. We know the community has to step up. And obviously, from our perspective, the partners in education have a real role to play. So what we're hoping today is that we'll get some information about the dropout problem, what causes it, and some of the things then that we can do will come out of knowing more about the problem. So it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker. And uh, Mr. Robert Murphy is um, the specialist of school completion and alternative programs at the Maryland State Department of Education. And he comes highly recommended through America's Promise, which is a group we have a lot of respect for. So um, if you're wondering about the connection, Heather went to a meeting, et cetera, and uh, came back saying, we've got to bring this guy to Tulsa. While in his, this role, he's been an integral leader in helping reduce the number of dropouts across the state by, get this, 35 percent. Wouldn't that be great if we could say that in Oklahoma? Robert also participates in the state's African American male work group in which he leads discussions on improving the performance of African American male middle and high school students. He's originally from Detroit, Michigan. He moved to Maryland to attend Morgan State University and continued his education at Goucher College where he earned a master's of education specializing in supervision and administration with a focus on the effects of voluntary and involuntary isolation on African-American males. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Robert now, and he's gonna come down from the back up there. Yes. He's got some great slides and some great facts, and I know you're gonna enjoy it. And thank you again um, for coming. We really appreciate it because we think this is important. Thank you. I forgot to mention that I'm the father of the best daughter in the world, Kaya Denise Murphy. No, I was kidding. I was kidding. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Tulsa Chamber of Commerce. Commerce, I'm sorry. Um, 
this is a, a very important subject um, for a lot of different people. It's important to me because it's who I am. Um, <laughs> but it's also important to us as a, as a nation. Um, and I think we're embarking on something that we have never done before. Um, and we're going to have to understand that there's going to be some peaks, there's going to be some valleys, there's going to be some challenges, there's going to be some, some successes. But we've got to begin to, as the title says, shift the paradigm for success for African American males. <clears throat> Historically, So let's talk about learning objectives real quick. <clears throat> We're all literate here, right? So I, I'm not to read. I, I hate when people present and they read to me, so I'm going to let you guys read. <laughs> One of the most important things to me is at the bottom, which is to have fun and share. This is a conversation about a subject that oftentimes is very touchy, um, that people don't feel comfortable about saying certain things. Um, I would, I would. Talk to everyone and let everybody know that we're family in here. And just like sometimes families agree and they disagree and they, they love and they, we're family here. And let's express the truth or let's express our truth. Contextual reality, my America. How many of you believe that there's a different America for blacks, whites, Latinos, Native Americans? So just about everybody in the building. Okay. So let me ask you some questions. What are some of the historical stereotypes of black men? You can yell it out. Oh, let me also add, too, if you have something you want to say, a question, a comment, whatever, please just raise your hand and say what you need to say. But can somebody give me some, some historical stereotypes for African-American boys and men? Yes, ma'am. They all rob and steal. All crooks. Angry. Angry. Lazy. Lazy. Anybody else? Great athletes. Great athletes. Anybody else? Great dancers. Great dancers. I can't dance a <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting married in November and I'm really worried like I'm going to do it. I've got to do the two step. <laughs> Anybody else here to share? Okay. Four fathers. Four fathers? Okay. So, when in there did we hear anything that was relatively positive with the exception of possibly athletics? So, let's talk about narratives. Narratives in the media. We've got apathetic towards education, overly aggressive. I think somebody mentioned over here violence. Some were menacing, and we talk about athletics. <clears throat> I once worked with a principal in Virginia who talked about an experience she had with a young man and a teacher. The African American boy was eight years old. He was about five foot two. He was about 140 pounds. Big kid for eight years old, second grade. Two weeks in his school experience, he was waiting. His teacher stood over here with all of his peers around her. And he talked, he was waiting patiently for her to get done with her peers. And I don't know, how, how many are teachers in here? Okay, so you know the routine when you say everybody's done, all the kids run up to you and they want to ask questions, they want to talk. So anyway, the young man stood there and just watched his teacher. Well, what ended up happening was once the teacher looked at him and saw him standing off to the side, she wrote him up on an officer for her and said, you know, you're menacing me. Which caused the little boy to start crying he breaks down. He doesn't know what's going on. Now, let's also put in context, he's two weeks into a school. So he doesn't have very many friends, if he has any. He doesn't know his teacher. He doesn't know anything other than his teacher just sent him to the office because he was menacingly looking at her. He gets to the office. He talks to the, the principal. The principal overlooks the officer for her. And to the principal's credit, she said, I'm not suspending a kid. What is menacing? What, what, what does that mean? How, what is that? And the teacher said, I felt very uncomfortable. I felt scared. When the teacher processed, I'm sorry, when the principal processed with the young man, what he said was, was all of my friends or all of my, my peers were around the teacher. I didn't want to go up to her and interrupt her, so I waited off to the side so she could have some space. And before I was even able to acknowledge or even able to talk to her, she wrote me up. What causes that kind of response from the teacher? 
Anybody care to share? Experience. Experience? <coughs> Fear. 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 Misunderstanding. Fear. Lack of confidence. Somebody else? Ignorance. Ignorance. Cultural competency. Cultural competency. I would argue that all of those things are right, <coughs> but I would argue too that because of the images that we see in the narrative that is projected in the media, um, oftentimes if, if there aren't daily or even interactions with African American people, men, or what, and, and it's the other side as well, that what happens is your focus or what you see African American men or boys as is violent as we talked about the stereotypes. So when you see TV, what do you see? You typically don't see Say again? Those images. Can anybody name to me a black show that was not a comedy that focused on a black family? Where the black family was the primary? Not a comedy. Not a comedy. Say, say Lincoln Heights? Yeah. Lincoln Heights was off for how long? <laughs> About two weeks. <laughs> two episodes. So I would, I would submit to you that this narrative in this media is just constantly reinforced by, you think about, and let's, let's go to, to the shows that we talked about, Cosby Show. Well, Cosby Show, you had a situation where you had a, a black doctor who was, uh, I forget what Cliff was, he was a uh, obstetrician, thank you. And his wife was a lawyer. Black people said, that ain't real. <laughs> White people thought it was a funny show, at least because it was the number one show in America, but there, there was no common ground. Let's, let's go back to even shows prior to that, Sanford and Son. Much as I loved the show, Fred was conniving, he was a racist, <laughs> he was lazy all the time. <laughs> let's go to Good Times. Somebody explain to me what was good about Good Times. Say it again? They had great family support. They lived in the projects, the son was shot, uh, James could never find a job. They were, both they were both uneducated. Florida was always a maid, and like I said, James could never find. Um, and James, oftentimes, was emasculated um, on TV. So again, so as we talk about the narrative and the media narrative, please understand we're all seeing these images. <clears throat> everyone, not just whites, but blacks, Latinos, and everyone else. So these narratives are, are, are very powerful. Very powerful. And just as they're powerful for African American men, they're also powerful for white men, Latino men, and Asian men. What are some of the stereotypes about Asians? Smart. Anybody else got anything? Because <laughs> that's the only one I always hear is they're smart. Anybody else? Family. They're family oriented. Family oriented. Hard -working. Said hard working? Hard workers. Entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs. Martial artists. Martial arts. OK. So our narratives, let me start talking about our narratives in, in, in homes. <clears throat> so when you see me, what do you see? Besides that I'm a good looking guy, what, what else do you see? <laughs> Black man. Articulate. Articulate. Got a tie on. Got a tie on, educated. About 6'2 and 207 pounds. Um, <laughs> but, yes, ma'am. Speaks with my hands and moves around because I got it was They were talking about me standing behind here, and I really couldn't do it because I, I struggled with, with, with just standing there. What you don't see is a young man who grew up in the city of Detroit who was shot at or had pistols pulled on him at least six times. Um, you don't see a young man who, in the sixth grade, <laughs> lived in four different homes, including our 78 Cup and Supreme. You don't see a young man who attended in middle school uh, three different schools and two different high schools. You don't see a young man who spent his 10th grade year pretty much on high school, in school suspension, in and out of school suspension. So we have to understand that, that the ground that we lay right now can propel or subvert young men and young women. So the narrative in the homes, when we look at kids coming to school, whether they be in Tulsa, Detroit, you name it, oftentimes we start looking at African-American males. A lot of the times we're talking about young men who, who essentially are adults. And I'll go back in, in my experience in Detroit. 
So when I was a kid, I was born in 1970, we had six automakers. Six became five, five became four, four became three. And Detroit's whole economy was built around the auto industry. A lot of my friends, when I, as I grew up, a lot of my friends' parents lost their homes, their parents split, so on and so forth. So what ended up happening? Because dads left and because the auto industry started shutting the plants, fathers left. So my buddies assumed the role of man in their house. And what they did was they started selling milk. Now, how do you tell a young man who is coming to, who's, who's essentially taking care of his family, He's paying the rent, he's paying the, uh, the rent, he's, he's paying cable, he's buying food, he's doing all these things. How do you tell him when he comes to your building, son, take off your hat? Or son, why do you sleep in my class? When he's up till 2 or 3 in the morning, selling dope, and then he's getting up at 7 a.m. to get his brother and sister ready for school. So the narrative in the house, clearly this isn't the case for all African-American males, because there are some males also that are doing very well, who are in stable households, whose parents, um, are committed, who are invested, who are doing their jobs. <clears throat> but there's also a large contingency that is essentially the man child. And unfortunately, sometimes when we're in schools, that's what we deal with. They don't understand and they're not feeling any rules or, or a rule about a hat or anything like that because, again, I'm taking care of my family. And quite frankly, I had a conversation I was sharing with Heather. Last summer, I drove all around the state and went to some of the DJS, our D, uh, Department of Juvenile Services placements where young men were locked up and asked them why they were there. Most of the time they were there for controlled substances. But one of the things they said was, was I would do it again. I would sell dope again because I'd take care of my family. There was a nobility to what they were doing. Now it was clearly wrong and they understood that they were wrong. But there was, there was a nobility to it. I don't know of any person in here that if you gave them, they put them in a situation and asked them to take care of their families that they wouldn't take care of their families. Um, and I would argue that, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, these young men have adult responsibilities thrust onto them before they're actually even ready to become adults. <clears throat> I'm sure none of you have seen this picture. That's just the East Coast thing. That's, that's not a Tulsa thing. <laughs> so we start talking about peer relations, the, neg the, the narrative of peer relations. Anybody ever heard of a thing called acting white? My response to my students was, what's acting black? Mm -hmm. It is not cool to be smart for African American males. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience and from experience as a young man, uh, or as a, as a teacher and as a principal. When I was a young man, I took the California Achievement Test. I'm sure I'm dating myself. Um, but I took the California Achievement Test, and I got <clears throat> sixth grade. I got a freshman in college for reading and writing. My score for my math scores were 12th grade. Now again, this is my sixth grade year. School was boring to me. I could pretty much get by with doing the absolute minimum and still get A's and B's in Detroit public schools. But what I also had to do was I also had to hide that from my buddies. I had no brothers. It was me and four sisters. And so I couldn't say, hey, you know, I want to be a part. My dream was to be an astronaut. But I couldn't articulate that, because that's not what black kids do. Black kids are athletes. And so even though I had this side dream that said, boy, I really want to be an astronaut. I, I really want to go into space. I had this other part of me, and, and this other part was a little bit po more powerful than my own dream. Um, it was, well, let me play football, which I was fortunately good at. But this narrative is real. And you think about the peer experiences that you have. Think about the peer pressure that you even face as an adult. And you've got your own stuff, whether it be a parent, a friend, cousin, whoever it is, sister, brother, whatever it is. We all face peer pressure, but understand that while we have the frontal lobe development to make right decisions for us, a boy at 15, 12, 13, whatever it is, doesn't have that frontal lobe development. And also, <coughs> excuse me, don't fit in with his peers. Because at a certain point, peers become more important than adults. Classroom narrative, <laughs> teacher expectations. Why don't you guys read that? Just 
And this is about negative teacher perceptions. And it estimates the impact of teacher perceptions almost three times as great for African Americans as white. So you face a barrier if you were black, you face a double barrier if you were black and poor. This basically talks about students, um, African American students who actually were doing very well in school. Um, but when they asked, when the, uh, the researcher asked them in the focus group, you know, kind of what were their challenges, the same students expressed frustration on the fact that they didn't feel like they were getting the support. They felt like they always had to prove themselves and they felt like they were treated differently. Lastly, of the four experimental studies examining teachers' treatment of black and white students, 72, 79, 73, 79, all four found that teachers were less supportive of black and white students. And I think it's important to, to highlight the word teachers. It does not say white teachers. It does not say Latino teachers. It says teachers, which includes African American teachers. There is this belief that because it's a black teacher, that the kid is going to get fair treatment, or it may even lessen the the uh, intensity of the uh, of the intervention or the consequence. None of the research says that that's true. In fact, in some cases, black principals and black teachers may be even more harsh than white teachers and white principals. So why do we think that happens? Anybody care to share? Say it again. Stereotypes. Stereotypes. Experiences. Is my bad thing? Assumptions. Assumptions. Faulty assumptions. Yes, sir. Anybody else care to share? Yes, ma'am. I, I, I was, was going to agree um, with my brother over here because there was a time when African American teachers they had it going on and they knew the struggle. Uh, I, and I think that it has it has changed. <clears throat> I think now African American teachers are so frustrated with the systems that they that they teach in mm -hmm. and, and what they are challenged with in our schools. And I think it frustrates them even more when they are trying to help African-American students. And everything is shifted to the point that they are so frustrated. It's like, okay, if you don't care, I don't care. I'm going to do my part. If you don't get it, you don't get it. Mm -hmm. but, I, but it was a time when, when black teachers, that was it. I mean, they were on point, and they cared, and they struggled to get us educated mm -hmm. because they understood the struggle. So it's changed. You, you, the you. Yes. I'm, actually, I'm actually a little bit younger than those two, but um, what I, pro I see is that... Excuse me. <laughs>
so they are harsher on them because they don't want their colleagues to say, oh, well, you're being easy on them because they are black, and they don't want that, that whole perception, so they're harsher just to make it look like mm -hmm. they are, they're teaching them differently. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, and then I'm, I can use it. I'm just curious if you have any uh, current day studies that uh, some information on studies that have been done more currently than the 70s to see if there's been any kind of change one way or the other. Now, I did a, a kind of a query of re actual research that was actually done on specifically related to teachers, uh, white teachers, and black students. This was the most recent stuff I came up with. Um, what I did, and there was another slide, let me go back. Uh, this was one of the more recent things that I found, um, and it was a meta-analysis um, of research. But it included everyone. It was not specific to African-American um, students. It included Asian students, it included uh, uh, African-American, Latino, and, uh, and white students, or European American. So those are the most recent things that, I, at least that I can find. Yes, sir, and then ma'am. Yes. Uh, I want to ask you, what is the concern of children in the classroom? Is there a study on that that speaks to the issue of them not seeing people of color in, in the education system? I have a daughter that just an observation of a particular elementary school where there was a student population right at 350. Uh, our ethnic mix was uh, ended up to the point to what we're talking about today. Uh, out of the 350, there were like 60 African American students. Mm -hmm. And this particular school was having this growth in the Latino and Hispanic population. Uh, concern from the head administrator of that school was out of the entire student population. Every, uh, as far as African American student population, all 60 of them had at some point in time been sent to the office mm -hmm. from, from one point, you know, one, one situation or another, and then also to another point, <coughs> the ethnic diversity population of the teacher. It was, it was, there was no overall diversity, as, you know, as far as uh, particularly gender, it was basically white female. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and to, truth be told, I think that that's really the, the narrative across the country is that you predominantly got females teaching, predominantly white females. I mean, we see in our state right now, and actually this is now another piece of my job is dealing with the whole issue of suspension or discipline. We'll be talking about that later on. But in our state right now, eight out of 10 suspensions in our state are boys. And most of it is for disrespect, it's for things that 
the way boys learn and do is a bit different than girls. Um, and the concern is, is that in some cases our boys are being sanctioned for, to some extent, being boys because there is a conversation around gender that needs to happen that, that hasn't happened. Yes, sir? You shared with us you know, your personal hurdles and challenges as a young person, and obviously you have overcome them. I, I would be curious as to what positive influences turned the corner for you and set you up going Specifically to me, I, have, I come from a family, um, let me talk about my two families. So on my dad's side, um, they're all immigrants. Um, my grandfather was from Chile, and my grandmother was from Trinidad and Tobago. My mother's mother was from Canada, um, and she was mixed. Um, so I say all that to say that there were a lot of reproduction going on in my family, if you will. Um, on my mom's side, there were 12 kids, and I had seven uncles, and four owned multi-million dollar businesses um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, another one was an astrophysicist, uh, astrophysics teacher at the University of Michigan. Um, another was a Detroit police officer. Um, so I had all these great examples, plus my dad was in the military for 35 years. Now, how I came about, speaking, being real, because we family in here, um, I, I only came about because my father uh, uh, had an extramarital affair with my mother, which created me. Um, but my father, even though there were times when he was, uh, he was, I was to some extent held hostage from him, continued to, to bang and continued to, to, to be supportive in whatever way he could. And truth be told, I would not have made my, my ascension through college and all that stuff without my, you know, without my dad. Um, but all of those people played a role. I remember Uncle Melvin, who's probably about 85 now, um, and I used to hate when he did it. Uncle Melvin would take me to these parks, and he would walk, and he'd be like, what's that flower? Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm a boy. I don't care about flowers. But, but we would go through the whole park, and we'd grab uh, leaves from the trees, and he'd ask what kind of tree it was, and all those things. And those were some of the fondest memories that I have of them all picking up the mantle of of leadership or fatherhood or mentoring or whatever it is with me, taking me to basketball games, engaging me on a lot of different levels, um, that I was able to kind of still see that even though I grew up in Detroit, which is rough and had the pistols and all that other stuff, I was still able to see another side. And I think that's that's what our young men are not seeing right now. I'm fortunate enough to come from a family that I, I saw both sides. So I could clearly choose, okay, am I going to be on this side or am I going to be on that side? Now, I struggled because there were some times when I was on this, this side, and there were some times when I was on that side. But I really began to really understand that this was the side that was safer, that was the better move, and that was the expectation of my family. Um, and I think, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, young men, particularly African-American young men, don't have that balance. Um, so they don't see the other side. They only see this one side. And then going back to the narrative of, of, of media, when you listen to what they listen to, um, it's negative, it's violent, it's, you know, it's all those things. And I'm a kid of hip hop, and I know some of you in here are, are also kids of hip hop. And when we first started listening to it, it was Run DMC, it was Sugar Hill Gang. It was really about party and having fun, having a good time. It wasn't about violence, it wasn't about sex, it wasn't about any of that. And now you've got just this constant you know, just assault on the senses about violence, sex, drugs. Violence, sex, drugs, I mean, that's all it is. And so, you think about it, I was talking to some young men one time, and the young men, they get up and they listen to the music. On the way to school, they're listening to it. They're sitting in class, and they're singing it, even though they can't listen to it, they, you know, they're mumbling the words of Lil Wayne, whoever it is. At lunchtime, they're putting their headphones back on, they're listening to it again, and then on the way home, they're listening to it again. So there's, they're almost getting inundated with just this negative message and negativity. Um, and I think that that kind of plays itself out because it, that, there's a hopelessness that's created to me by that music. <clears throat> so anyway, back to our presentation. <laughs> um, what day that can be observed at the school level? Because that's, that's the rubber meets the road. I mean, I can talk to you about you know, the research and this and that and that and this. But at the end of the day, what day that can be observed at the school level? Anyone care to share? Not enough? Okay. Robert, real quick.
quickly, I have a question. Yes. Um, you're speaking a lot about um, the stereotypes and the things that African American males have to go mm -hmm. have to go through or experience on a daily basis. Could you also speak to how that relates to just boys in general? Mm -hmm. um, as we spoke last night, we were talking about how just boys in general seem to have a little bit more difficulty in school environments than girls. So you, could you also speak about that as well? Okay. So <clears throat> years ago in Maryland, we did uh, some research on boys and girls. And so it, the research was done on, I believe, like a second or third grade classroom. So the boys were laid and sprawled out on the floor. They were punching each other. They were wrestling. They were doing all these different things while the girls sat at the desk and were taking notes and all this stuff. <laughs> So when they asked them to kind of rehash, you know, the lesson that was taught to them, the boys could very clearly say this, 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 this. And it shocked researchers, or at least it shocked Maryland researchers, because they thought because the boys were doing all of this stuff and they were so physically active that they weren't catching the lesson, but they actually were catching the lesson. And so I think what Heather's speaking to is that there is a difference in education, and I don't know that we in education really talk about that difference. Um, there is a gender difference. <clears throat> we always talk about, you know, the, the male dominance, but we don't necessarily talk about the education of female dominance and what that looks like and sometimes how that plays out in schools. I, I, I talk to many of, uh, of uh, administrators, male administrators, teachers, whatever it is, and there are certain behaviors that men just say, eh. But in other cases with women, women say, that's an officer for Men will say, you know, I, I could, myself included, I, there were times when my young ladies would, Mr. Murphy, la, 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 and they'd be lying, I'd be like, baby, why are you yelling at me? We're not in the stadium. But in, in a lot of cases, that's an office bro, because you're too loud. We looked at, <clears throat> and I'll jump off topic a little bit, because we were, uh, uh, this is actually a part of the, 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 the uh, discipline conversation. But when we look at how it impacts boys, how boys learn, boys' experiences are vastly different. What boys do is a little bit different than what girls do. And I don't know that we, have, again, have that conversation as we're training teachers. A lot of what we do is talking about instruction, 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 instruction. And we don't really spend a whole lot of time on the what's, social, what's, what's uh, socially appropriate, what's developmentally appropriate for both boys and girls. Later on, there's some slides that talk about discipline and, and, and discipline in schools. When I looked at Maryland's data, um, <clears throat> it's actually funny because when you look at the numbers of suspensions from fifth to sixth grade, it's almost like our kids go to summer camp in hell. And, and they're like, yeah, they come back to school in sixth grade, yeah, Satan, yeah, yeah. Because you look at the suspensions and they're almost quadruple what they were in the fifth grade. And most of it is, in the state of Maryland, is disrespect, insubordination, disruption in class, Things like that. I actually go around and I ask people, what is disrespect? And when you talk to teachers, it's a bit different. So in one class, it's, you know, I roll my eyes at you. In another class, it's I threw a chair. In another class, it's I didn't bring my pencil. So my question is, how does any kid get to be okay with that? Like when you're driving here, when you're driving here, the speed limit was what, 35, 40, whatever it was? I'm one of those who tends to push the envelope a little bit when I drive, so I typically go five to seven over. But if I get a ticket, I know why I got a ticket. But if I'm a kid in a school and I go between your classroom, your classroom, and your classroom, the rules are vastly different as it relates to what's disrespect, what's insubordination. And again, those are the reasons why kids are being suspended. And I know I'm past, I'm a pass. Because <laughs> that's actually a later priority. Thank you, Heather, for, for taking me off track a little bit. <coughs> But attendance, so the types of attendance, we've got high attendance, satisfactory attendance, chronic Does anybody know what the Oklahoma standard is or, or regulation is as it relates to what is considered truancy in, in the state of Oklahoma? We've got some friends that are more days. Ten or more days? Is that a quarter or is that for a year? Semester. Okay. School. Okay. And ours is, is relatively, it, it's relatively similar. I would suggest to you, though, that that's too much because I'm actually about to show you a slide. This is incoming freshman. So, and this is whether the day is excused or unexcused. Zero to four days, they have an 87% completion rate on time. And obviously, as you go with more days, 
it goes down. So I would suggest to you that 10 days is too much. That's 20 days a year, right? Actually, that's 40 days a year if it's, if it's 10 days a semester. Or I'm sorry, 10 days a quarter. Mm, it's 10 days a semester. 10 days a semester, okay. So it's 20 days a year total. Right. And we only have 175 days. Okay. So you look at these numbers, and I would ask the question, how many of you guys are doing attendance in your buildings? How many of you guys are even talking about attendance in your buildings? How many, is, is, whether it be partners, whether it be staff members, whatever, how many of you are talking about attendance, and how many of you are highlighting specific kids that miss? Because one of the things with attendance is, when we start talking about classrooms, everybody has AYP. I don't know what the state of, AY, uh, state of um, uh, Oklahoma standard is, but I know in Maryland, it's a 94% attendance rate. Well, if you've got a bunch of kids who attend all the time, and you've got several kids who attend some or little time, those lot of kids on the, on the firing who come all the time are going to pretty much eliminate whatever gap uh, the, the kids who come some of the time will. So we're actually looking at chronic absenteeism, whether that be, it's, whether that be excused absence or unexcused absence. We're beginning to, I guess, drill down a little bit longer, a little bit deeper. And we're looking at one to three absences as really being kind of like, we need, we need to do an intervention. Yes, ma'am? Are you looking at it in elementary, or are you waiting? We're looking at it across, across the whole system, yes. We're having a lot of conversations about early trauma. Yes. You get it early, then your graduation rate, everything just going to be on the upswing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, attendance incentives. Um, incentives don't always have to be financial. You don't always have to pay for stuff. I know sometimes as adults we figure, oh, we got to buy PlayStations or iPods or whatever it is. We don't have to do all that. Sometimes it's, it's lunch with a buddy, so their favorite teacher. Sometimes it's lunch with, with the staff member in the hallway or whatever it is. Sometimes it's early dismissal. Sometimes you let them leave a little bit or five minutes early for the bus or five minutes early for lunch. Um, truancy courts. There's a place in Baltimore right now, and I know people see truancy courts and they say, oh my God, that means that, there, you know, that there's, there's some type of legal thing involved. But there's not. In Baltimore, they're doing a program where they've got judges, district court judges who have volunteered, and they've adopted a school, and they come in. There are no sanctions that are given to kids. What they do is they develop a goal and a plan for kids to attend school. And then they provide incentives. Some are financial incentives. Some are material incentives. Some are just run-of-the-mill incentives in schools. Um, <clears throat> that help promote or push kids to actually come to school. Some of the things that they found out is that kids aren't coming to school because they don't want to. Sometimes kids are coming because they don't have clean clothes. Or they don't have lunch money. Or they weren't able to do their homework because they're, they're sleeping four or five deep in the house. So what they elected to do was they bought kids, in some cases they bought kids like meal pass, in some cases they bought extra clothing, extra uniforms for kids. That's another thing. <laughs> if, kids are, if kids are wearing uniforms at school, give them a dress down there. You want them to comply, say that there's a dress down there at the end of this incentive. <laughs> and in most cases, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll uh, comply. Classroom, school-wide celebrations, and then free lunches. I didn't talk about it, but I have an ACC of dropout prevention. Am I a college basketball fan? I know this is Big 12 territory here, but uh, I do the ACC because uh, that's where I live. But ACC, attendance, conduct, and coursework. So we got conduct here now. Let me ask you guys, what's the purpose of suspension? Say again. Punishment. Anybody else? Anybody else? Help control the, the uh, environment for the other students. Mm -hmm. Help control the environment for the other students. I, hear, I see some head nod on that. Anybody else care to share? An unrealistic teacher expectation uh, suspension would be to give me some time to work with students that really want to be taught. Mm -hmm. really okay. I've heard when that question is asked, I've heard many things. I've heard, well, it's a way to get the parents involved. Get them, make them inconvenience. I've also heard that it's a break for teachers. Kids been giving you all this trouble. <laughs> it's a break. Oops. True or false? If we suspend students for their behavior, uh, their behavior will change and become better. False. False? You guys don't believe that? 
Wow. Suspension and expulsion are associated with improved school climate, lower dropout rates, and higher achievement. False. Wow. So the question for me is, why do we do it? <laughs> Anybody know why we do it? Because it's always been done. Okay. So let's talk about the impacts of suspension on young people. So we talk about isolation. They're isolated from their peers. They're isolated from teachers that, that actually, or teachers or supports that actually might care about them. They're isolated from the cafeteria worker that might actually give them an extra chicken nugget or an extra french fry or table tie at lunchtime. They're isolated from people who are going to support them. They're isolated, isolated from those people, but they're also exposed to those people who don't care about education. That got a gang problem in Tulsa? Yeah. Who's here? Is it Bloods and Crips? Or oh, MS-13? Or Mosquitoes and All of them? Y'all got the gumbo of, of, <laughs> of gangs. <Yeah. laughs> <clears throat> Characterization. So I, Robert, who does whatever he does, when we go to the teacher's lounge, and I sit next to Susan, and I say, you know, Susan, that Robert Murphy is just a pain in the heart. God, is so, he just causes me a problem. So what happens with Susan? Susan then says, when Robert comes to her in fifth grade, I keep my eyes on him. And so it starts this cycle where Robert's, Robert's behavior may have been inappropriate and all those things, but he becomes a victim initially. And then he becomes indoctrinated into his, into his behavior. Because here's the deal. At 11 or 12, I really don't know who I am just yet. But when teachers start defining me and telling me who I am, <coughs> then I begin to kind of embrace those things. Quick example for me, when I transferred out of Detroit Public Schools, I went to a town called Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is where my family is from, uh, my mother's family. <coughs> I went to the same high school as my cousins. And the principal, assistant principal, would ask me, how come you don't act like your cousins? Barry, Dave, and Saray are, are, are wonderful kids. How come you're just, how come you're so much trouble? Now imagine I'm 16. I'm already in a place where I don't really fit in. Because each, anybody know about Grand Rapids, Michigan? Okay, Grand Rapids, Michigan is on the western, western side of Michigan. It's vastly different than Detroit. It's almost like they're in a different country. <laughs> it's, it's vastly different. And so the culture in Detroit is a little bit, obviously, vastly different than culture of Grand Rapids. And I was struggling with navigating that culture of Grand Rapids. Um, and he kept saying to me, you know, why don't you be like your cousins? Which then made me say, well, I'm going to go the exact opposite. So when we even talk about kids in schools, particularly African-American males, and I would argue really any kid, you're looking at young people who, if you don't have a relationship with them, I'm going to give you everything I got. <laughs> Because there's, there's no reason for me to respect you. There's no reason for me to tone myself down. I already have accepted the fact that you don't like me. And so now let me tell you that I don't like you in so many different ways. Um, so there's a characterization and then the alienation, which means which eventually leads to the dropout and, and all of those things. Does to, yes, ma'am. slide a couple slides down but it's, it's okay because I think that's a, that's a real point um, do we have a suspension problem I would argue we have a suspension problem and an office referral problem because you can't get suspended without an office referral in most cases so I would argue that we actually have both problems um, and to the young lady's point in the front I'm gonna move past that part so let's talk about suspension as an intervention because 
in yesteryear, as the gentleman talked about back in the day, when the, the school called and said, Robert acted up, somebody was at home and answered the phone. Typically, that was mom. Mom said, wait till your dad gets home. And then when dad got home, the consequences were, were, were dealt. Right now, and I'm, I'm just speaking to Maryland, <laughs> right now we get cell phones as home numbers. And we get Boost Mobile, we get the page and go phones oftentimes as, as numbers. How do you communicate <laughs> with that parent? And you get, you get addresses that are not real addresses. So the question becomes, how, do you, how is this an effective intervention anymore? And then I would also submit to you that me who got suspended, I could do work backwards and forwards. So mine was not an issue of I didn't understand. Mine was just this is boring, it's I don't know what to mean, and I'm not sure I'm gonna have fun. I would agree with you, there is another side though, where it is I don't understand, I don't know what's going on, so I'm gonna act out because I just don't know. But there is also a side which is I know what's going on, I'm just bored. I was a kid, to be totally honest, I probably should have been in GT because my grades indicated that I should have been, I never was put in. So for me, I got to traditional education like my buddies, and I pretty much showed my behind in some cases. What is GT? I'm sorry, gifted and talented. Thank you. Yes. You guys got to get GT here, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, think, I think also, just a little bit off of uh, Victoria's comment, also suspension can dictate on the resources that are available to the child within their home as well, because uh, what we do with some children who may have uh, come from a different resource level or economic level, we can define and find interventions to do with them within the school. Mm -hmm. But this kid over here, we can put them out because we know we can't get that boosted mobile number and we know that parents not going to come in here to the test and even with a lawyer mm -hmm. a lot of times. And so mm -hmm. you figure out, well, and what you should be doing equally for both, for both sides, mm -hmm. you end up saying, let's just put them in here get them their work and have the teachers check on them. But with this kid, it's a lot easier to remove them out of this environment because they don't have the resources. The resources we have to really remember play into about 60 to 70 percent of the things that go on within the school that dictates the outcomes for their students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys know about the national conversation that's happening around suspension? Okay, so right now there is a conversation taking place between the Department of Justice and the Department of Education. <laughs> Quite frankly, they're looking at the school to prison pipeline. Everybody heard of the school to prison pipeline. Their argument is, and their concerns uh, are, that oftentimes many African American males or, or African American males or, or, or males of color are being suspended for things that really aren't warranted um, and should, should be, could be, and should be managed in the school. So down the road, maybe five years, maybe seven years from now. Please understand that this may not be an option for schools. Um, I know in our state right now, to a lot of consternation of the local school systems, we're looking at eliminating suspension for nonviolent offense. Um, because when you look at the time, you're looking at whether it's a day or 10 days. If you look at one day suspension, they're missing 360 minutes of instructional time. If they miss 10 days, then you're talking about 3,600 minutes. To kids who are struggling, to those kids that you brought up, man, who, who aren't really getting it, they're missing 36 minutes of instruction. We're also looking at trying to, to create ways that we can actually teach them while they're still at home. So we're looking at possibly podcasts. We're looking at, at situations where there may be the classroom may be actually uh, monitored so a kid can tap into uh, the, the school system website and actually look at his class, look at the instruction. Uh, we're trying to find all kinds of resources because this is a huge issue. And in our state last year, if we look at uh, 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 Un unduplicated suspensions. We're looking at about 67,000 kids that were suspended last year in Maryland. I don't know what the numbers are in, in Oklahoma. Um, I couldn't find that when I was looking through the Oklahoma Department of Education uh, website. <laughs> Everybody laughed. <laughs> Is there something you guys are telling me about the Oklahoma Department of Education? They, they can't find that information. <laughs> well, that, that's one of the important things as it relates to dropping out is that you're talking about kids who are missing. So if you, can't, if you can't even tell me how many times a kid's been suspended, mm -hmm. why they've been suspended. I mean, in Maryland, one of the things we have is, is there is a uh, discipline code. And I'm sure you guys probably have, I would hope that you guys have it. When it speaks specifically, this is the code that I'm using. Disres disrespect is, I think, 801. Insubordination is 802. 
uh, disruption in class is 803. And so when you fill out the suspension information, the system gathers the information and says that 1,500 kids were suspended for disrespect in that particular um, um, system. But then we also break it down by school. So we go school, we go gender, race, and then why they were suspended. We're looking at actually adding how long the kid was suspended. Um, because we think it's important enough to find out, was this a one-day suspension? Was it a two-day, five-day, ten-day, forty-five-day? What is it? And I'm, what I'm hearing is that you guys don't necessarily collect all of that data. The district collected. The district collected. Is oh okay. What's prohibiting them from posting it? Does anybody know, or is it just? Bad for the Republicans. <laughs> 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 this is not a political conversation. <laughs> so, <laughs> some alternatives to suspension are our detention, peer counseling. Kids do, do very well when it's them, relating to them, and talking to them. Um, oftentimes, if we just get out the way sometimes, we, we, we'd be a lot better off. Um, letters of apology, community service, student support team interventions. You guys got uh, student support teams, SSC here, don't you? It might just be called something else, where the practitioners in the school get together and they, they highlight specific kids who are set up. Child study, okay. Um, mini course, skill, mock, skill modes. So if you got a kid who's got an anger, anger problem, perhaps rather than suspend them, um, you put in maybe an ISS and give him that kind of that skill building thing where he learns how to manage his behavior, uh, manage his anger, and then kind of gets into what his anger really is about. And then PB, uh, PBIS or PBS, positive behavior supports. Um, and I know you guys are using that some places here. And then lastly, explicit, explicit rules for suspension, beha uh, suspension uh, behavior. One of the challenges is, is kids don't know. It really depends on the, the teachers, where the teacher is that particular day. Um, so if my card is told, and I'm, I'm, quite frankly, I'm pissed, then that might lead to a more significant consequence for you than if, you know, me and my wife just got back from vacation. <laughs> I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on coursework, but these are some indicators really quick. Um, if you failed math or you, fa you failed math or you failed English, um, you've got a real serious issue. Um, you probably aren't going to graduate on time. Um, and then sixth graders. And I guess I need to ask, when are you guys really looking at these kids as it relates to dropout prevention? When are you, when are you putting in interventions? When are you doing anything around these kids? Sixth grade? Good. So I went on the TPS website, and I wasn't really able to get a whole lot of data. So then I went to the <laughs> Department of Education, the Oklahoma Department of Education. I was able to get some data. So this is what I could I could call from the different sources. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, go back real quick. Yes. Okay. okay. You good? So when I looked at your data, there were like five high schools that really were kind of the, the highest for African American uh, males, or African Americans, I'm sorry, because I couldn't really tell if it was females or males. Um, but it was Tulsa, Metro, uh, I'm guessing Met, is that Metro? Yeah. Met, Lombard? Okay. That's what I figured it was, because it's, it's, it had the highest drop out rate. Um, Memorial High, McLean, Will Rogers, Central, and then the totals. Um, what was a bit disturbing to me was African American males are a problem, or African American students are a problem, but Tulsa as a school district, like in our state, seven out of, seven, seven out of our ten dropouts are, are male. In Tulsa, it's a bit different. It's almost 50-50, male to female. Anybody got any any reasons why that might be the case? Because I was actually pretty stunned when I, when I looked at it. Yes. Is you, then you, and then over here. Yes. Teen pregnancy in high school. Uh, a lot of the girls will go out and go to work to help support families. Mm -hmm. 
they tend to be able to find jobs easier than the males, so mm -hmm. they drop out of school and do that. Okay. Somebody over here. That's it. That was kind of what I was thinking too, but I didn't want to assume. Um, this is all TPS dropout. Now this is at the top five high schools. So African American students represented 39% of your suspensions at the top five dropout schools for African Americans. But when you look system wide, it was 39 to 30% at the high African American schools. But when you look system wide, it was 37 to 32. So white kids are struggling too. And Latinos for that matter. And even more of your data, 73% 70 of your suspensions, I'm not sorry, your, your uh, dropouts actually take place between 9th and 11th grade. Mm -hmm. I found it ironic, though, that another 17% were pre 9th grade, which means those kids are dropping out of middle school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lost hope, um, and there's some issues, teen pregnancy, um, there's a lot of different issues going on. Um, most TPS dropouts are 18. I think the state law here is 16, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. But you look at the numbers, there were last year, there were 214 18-year-olds, 213, 17 year olds 160 16 year olds And again, that's exclusive to Tulsa, and this looks at um, uh, middle and high. And as I mentioned to you before, both genders are at risk. The males uh, represent 53% and females 47%. So we talk about dropout prevention. We're talking about prevention. I'm sorry, ma'am. I didn't see you way back there. Um, I had a question. Has anybody done any research? Has anybody done any research um, comparing the dropout rate um, in different states with maybe stricter regulations or uh, for like alternatives? Are there any states with stricter regulations? Like if you drop out. Um, you know, for example, in Oklahoma, you have to do X, Y, Z to be able to get your GED, mm -hmm. whereas in a different state, there might be stricter regulations. Has anybody done any studies to show if there's a difference? I don't know that anybody's had a study. I know there's been some studies done around uh, um, states that have raised their age of compulsory attendance. Okay. In fact, we're actually in the process now of working with the Mid-Atlantic uh, Regional uh, Education Lab. They're going to do a study for us around we're raising our age of compulsory attendance from 16 to 18. Um, it's a technocratic solution to really an adaptive problem, um, which is we're going to raise the age and that's going to end all the kids dropping out. Um, our legislature hasn't put any money behind it, so what we'll have is probably a reduction in dropout rates, but a, an increase in truancy. Um, and the schools won't send anybody out to go get these kids because they don't have the money to do it. Um, but again, when we did our study, um, and I'll send these resources to, um, to Heather and Susan, um, we've got a bunch of studies we've done. We did one on compulsory attendance in 2008 um, that actually looked at raising the age, and we also looked at states that had already um, raised the age 18, and we really didn't see any significant difference in their completion rates. Yes, and then yes, yes, yes. Um, is Red Cross and research that uh, where there were states Okay, I, I'm going to take off my Maryland State Department of Education hat. Uh, we did a study. Our study said that when we, we pushed our HSAs, which are our high school assessments, um, you have to pass them to actually graduate, um, that there wasn't an issue um, with kids staying around and, and actually completing. What I know from anecdotal uh, information, I was still at a school when this came in place, and I had probably 10 to 20 of my kids say, I'm not going to go on because I, I can't pass that test. Yeah, we just <laughs> so, I, you know, research-wise, no, but anecdotally, I can say my experience said that that, that wasn't the case. Yes, sir.
better alternative than to have a one bedroom. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just wondering if the dropout rate parallels that. Frankly, no. Um, our dropout rate has pretty much stayed consistent for the last probably 40 years. 1970, about 70% of our kids were completing on time. And in 2012, about 75% of our kids were completing on time. Um, so to your point, um, there was research done by Morehouse University, and I think in 1968, 68% of all African American students lived in a two parent household, and in 2008, it was like 17 or 20%. Um, it depends on the state, obviously, but what we don't see is there's a clear correlation between two parent households and completion because the numbers don't really indicate that it really has an impact. Somebody else have a hand up? Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, talking about the state of Oklahoma, now Oklahoma does rank 49 as far as uh, expenditure per pupil. Mm -hmm. now, I guess we're shooting for 51st, but because <laughs> many getting money is next to year. But you know, you, you touched on that that budgetary. Mm -hmm. you know, those are constraints as well as far as even fighting dropout. Say the question again, I'm sorry. Well, the budgetary impact of not having funding to you know, put special programs. I've been talking to a lot of educators, and, and my concern is educators are going to go the way of the dinosaur. Um, being real, I doubt that we're going to get any more money. So that means we might have to do more with less. Or we have to reprioritize, which I think we're probably going to have to do. When you look at, and I'm just, I'm just speaking to, to Maryland and Baltimore specific. So Baltimore City Public Schools has a $1.4 billion um, budget for their school system. Baltimore County, which is the surrounding county outside of Baltimore, has a $1.45 billion budget. We're talking about cities where a third of the budget is related to public education for numbers that don't say that when we, we, again, looking at graduation rates, we have not seen this increase in graduation, even though we've investing all, we've been investing all this money. There's actually an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, maybe two days ago. It was in the opinion section. And the, the I forget who the, the um, author was, but he talked very clearly that we've seen a growth in public education students of 8.5%. So nationally, we've seen our number of students grow 8.5%, but we've seen a 40% or 41% increase in the number of teachers. So the guys are the, 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 the uh, author's argument is, so where is the, the improvement? And you don't really see the improvement. I mean, we've been doing Title I for years. And in some cases, we see some Title I elementary schools doing well. I don't know if we see middle schools or high schools do it. Well. So I, my argument to educators and to us is that we, we have to recognize that, that things are changing. And we're going to have to adjust. Yes, ma'am. My question is, since you said teachers, does that also include administrators and your parents in that number? And how does that relate to class size? Uh, mm -hmm. Like in Tulsa, we have so many for elementary and so many for our secondary. And, you know, we all know as educators, class size is a big determination as to suspension rate, behavior, expectations. All of those things fell apart mm -hmm. in that particular city. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that, and I don't necessarily disagree with you, I would argue that the culture that we have right now is not supportive of that being the issue. The issue is we're broke. Mm -hmm. We can't afford to keep putting money, good money to bad. We don't see any improvement. It would be different if we could say very clearly that we've invested this in edu education and we see our graduation rate has gone from 70% in 1970 to 85 or 90% in 2012. We can't say that. We can say that it's gone from 70 to 75. Um, so it's not enough of a jump for us to, to, to say, you know, well, you need to support education, and quite frankly, Right now, there are a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about changing how we do education. Um, privatizing it, vouchers, you name it, um, are all discussions nationally and quite frankly, even 
the Obama administration has put some things in place that say you have to support charter schools, even though the data on charter schools doesn't say that charter schools are actually successful. Um, in some cases, they, they, they produce less than the actual public schools. Yes, sir? And you got Oak Park Public Schools, so you got all these different localities that have their own public school system, which leads, I think, in the state of Michigan, there's like 995 or four or three um, school systems in the state of Michigan. In Maryland, they do it real simple. There are 24, 23 counties, 23 counties have a school system, and Baltimore City has its own school system. That's it. And it does make it a whole lot easier to manage because you don't have 400 people you got to talk to at a meeting or build consensus on 400 people. You've got 24 people to build consensus on, and that's typically what happens. So the numbers, I mean, yeah, the sheer numbers, 500, is, is incredible. Um, back to the presentation. Um, as we look at the Tulsa data, I'm going to leave these questions with you guys. I'm going to pass them on to Heather because I know we're running time. It's 1020 or 1120 right now. Or am I, am I head time? No. It's 1120? Okay, thank you. No, I didn't mind my watch. <laughs> um, so questions for TP, uh, TPS. Do I, what do elementary school teachers see as their role in dropout prevention? Somebody's laughing back there. Do you guys know, is, is there anything that's been said to you by elementary school teachers? Because here's, here's the deal. High, school, high schools is where dropouts are measured and where it happens. But it happens long before they get to high school. Long before. Try elementary and middle. High school is when it becomes legal. Yes, ma'am. School does what it does. I think one of the, as it relates specifically to African American males and as it relates to dropouts in general. So we look at engagement. There are three types of engagement. There's emotional engagement, behavioral engagement, and cognitive engagement. I'm going to read, I'm not even going to read this. I'll speak to really the Bible, which is essentially emotional engage, engagement is feelings and motivation. Do I feel like I should be here? Do I have a relationship? Do I feel anything? Behavioral engagement is my conduct, my routine. How do I do things? Is there a routine? Is there a structure? Um, and there are my actions and habits. Cognitive draws on um, your work, its values, belief, and skill development. One of the things we're struggling with with dropouts is, is we to get to here, which is where the work is done, you got to get there and there. And I'm going to argue that if you don't first have that, you're not going to get here. And you sure are not going to get here. Think about your students and think about young people. 
I don't think I've ever heard it, had a, a, a student come up to me and say, Mr. Murphy, I really enjoyed your pedagogical skills. Your, your use of multiple intelligences were, were fantastic. Uh, the core classwork was absolutely magnificent. What they said was, he likes me, but she, she doesn't like me. They're speaking from a very emotional standpoint. Anybody, anybody raise teenagers? I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm thinking my last year tour of duty was with my mind. <laughs> Anything you say to teenagers, it's a, I'm going to give you 50000 I'm going to take you out there. I mean, that's what they do. That, that, it's almost like it's, it's a genetic code. Um, but everything for them is emotion. And quite frankly, we as adults say to them, uh, perform and we'll love you. And they say to us, love us and we'll perform. And it's like ships passing in the night. Um, unfortunately, we have, we have the pen, though, and the power of the pen. So... They oftentimes are <coughs> relegated based on what we do. This is an interesting, this is a scan of a brain, obviously. So this is somebody who's been excluded from activities. This is somebody who's been included in activities. The brain, when someone's excluded from activities or when they feel like they're not a part of something, interprets that as pain, physical pain. So what does your body do when, it, when, it, when physical pain happens? It produces cortisol and all these things to actually mitigate the pain. So when you're in your buildings, when you're in your communities, whatever it is, and you see young people walking around and you don't acknowledge them, you don't engage them, think about what that's doing to them. This is incredibly interesting to me because it's, 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 there's actually a physical um, or physiological thing that happens. Anyway, um, engage your statements. Tell me more about that. What do you mean when you say what else? How do you know what's, what is important to you? Um, what does that remind you of? In other words, what do you think? How would you? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. That's a later slide, but you, you already beat me to it. No, 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 it's, it's all good, because we're, we're running out of time. But I think that's a very important thing, is to make education real for them. Um, and that's what we don't do. Real quick, I talked in a jail, uh, a boys' jail, 2000 to 2002. My boys did not understand fractions. They didn't understand decimals. No matter how I used the book, the instruction, it did not work. So what I did to teach them decimals and fractions is, I said, most of them were locked up for selling dope. What was your cut? 
What you mean, Mr. Murphy? If you sold a thousand dollars worth of dope, what was your cut? Oh, I made two hundred dollars. Son, that, that's 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 <laughs> that's price. That's, that's all it is. That's two fifths. Really? Yeah. And we could move forward as long as it was made real for them. But to your point, if it wasn't real for them, if I said, you know, I went to the gym last night and I was on the elliptical for yeah. an hour and I got burned forty-seven calories, what? <laughs> I mean, it, it went, you know, then we talked about, you know, decibels and even sales tax and all those things, and we talked about going to the mall. Um, my boys, because they sold dope, spent a whole lot of money and time at the malls. So we talked about if you bought a Fuji sweater, if you bought Air Jordans, you know, and, you, and, we, and I made it real for them by saying to them, you don't want anybody stealing your money from you. So if you can't do your sales tax and do how much it costs you, then you can essentially give them money, and they might not give you no change, right? You don't even know. It made it real for them. Um, and I would agree with you, we've, we've got to be in to make it real for them um, and from the academic standpoint. But I would also argue that not only from a cultural standpoint, but again from a relational standpoint, if I know that you care, if I know that you're invested, because this, this is the conversation that I've had and this is the conversation that happens all over Maryland and all over the country, is we hear from kids, whether they be Latino, black, and even in some cases white, nobody cared if I came to school. Nobody cared. Nobody said, I'm happy you're here. Nobody said, I'm glad. Nobody said anything. They didn't feel wanted. They didn't feel engaged. Were you going to raise your hand, sir, or no? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so part of the strategies, share your stories. I'm going to come back to you, sir. I'm sorry I missed you. Share your stories. This is part of breaking down the barriers. Because here's the deal. As we separate as communities, the perception of one community may be that it doesn't even rain in some communities. There are some whites who've had it rough. And they can share their stories. There's nothing wrong with that. Just like there's some blacks who've had it relatively easy. They can share their stories. There are ways to share stories. We can't think because we're white or because we're Latino or whatever it is, we can't express kind of some of our hardships. Now, clearly, I'm not suggesting you go out and say, my wife cheated on me or my husband cheated on me, anything like that. But what I am speaking to is there are hardships that we all face. Perhaps it's a death. I was sharing with someone earlier, my daughter's, uh, my ex died when my daughter was 13 years old. Um, those are common things that happen to people, um, and we have to overcome those things. Um, so it breaks down some of those walls. Participate, and again, these are part of the strategies, participate in school improvement teams. You guys got SIT teams here, right? Where the community comes in and they're a part of these teams, they talk about different data and so on and so forth. Survey and engage the communities. Oftentimes, particularly in, in people of color's neighborhoods, they feel like things are being done to them and not with them. Amen. <laughs> I'm <at> church now. <laughs> very important, very important. You can't just do things to people. They've got to get, you've got to get their buy-in for it to actually work. Um, develop mentoring programs, and some of you already have those things. Um, and then survey annotated codes, Oklahoma annotated codes, or codes of regulation. In Maryland right now, we can get kids up to nine credits for, um, for life experience as long as the school system signs off on it. So think about, you're looking at your report card and you got zero credits, two in a matter of six weeks, eight weeks, a year, whatever it is, you got nine credits. It's a whole lot different when you, there's a whole lot more optimism when you look at that report card and it says nine credits versus when it says zero credits. But I would again say, survey whatever your annotated code or your code of regulation says about credit earning. We can earn credits in Maryland for tutoring, um, you can earn it for life skills. You can earn it for a lot of different ways. You can earn it for work experience. Um, so utilize the law and the rules to your benefit. And I'm not going to get into this real quick, but I'll just speak to it real quickly. Um, I talk a lot about relationships, and a lot of the, the research says relationships, relationships. We've got to build relationships, but nobody tells people how to do it. And if it's not an innate skill, then you, you pretty much are going to struggle. So it's kind of what we came up with. <clears throat> so kind of actions that the person may do is they show safety or they're safe, they're consistent, communication, and they care. These are just basic actions that a person can do to make someone feel like they're trustworthy. And if they're trustworthy, then they can invest in the relationship. And once they can invest in the relationship, now I've got some confidence about our relationship and about you're not going to turn your back on me and run. And particularly as it relates to African American students, they've had a lot of times where people have told them things, set them up, and then let them down. In some cases they've been teachers, in some cases they've been family members. Oftentimes they're family members. 
So once I've got confidence, then I can perform. And this is an action, obviously. The other are emotions. Okay, I'm over time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can I just I'm say this, Heather, and I'm, I'm done? Okay, seven seeds. If we communicate our commitment with clarity and consistency, we can cultivate challenge and change in our students. Thank you. <laughs> I actually really hated to cut him off because I know he had a lot of things, a lot of good things to say. And um, Susan and I had the opportunity to have dinner with him last night, and we um, pumped him and, and um, questioned him heavily. And so he he really had a lot of good information. And unfortunately. Um, because I want to respect all of your time, <laughs> I have to cut this off. But I would like to thank Robert for coming out here and presenting this information to us. He has also said that he will provide us with his presentation, so in about a week or so, it will be on the Chamber's website, or there will be a link to his um, to the video presentation on the Chamber website, so you can access that and see that and share it um, with your colleagues as well. And then, um, trying uh, not to get emotional when I say this, but um, mo I think most of you know that this is my last Partners in Education Forum. Um, my husband and I are moving, and our children are... <laughs> and my children, so, no, um, I take them. <laughs> my husband and I and our children are moving to Denver at the end of this month. Um, my husband, Michael Johnson, has accepted the job it's as a principal of George Washington High School in Denver, Colorado, so we will be leaving. But it has truly been a pleasure being the program manager of education at the Tulsa Chamber. I really, did, really enjoyed it. It was often challenging, and I had many of you in this room as my mentors on what to do in the program and how to approach different topics. And I know that in education, it's often very emotional and um, a lot of things are happening in education. I know all of you are very dedicated to it and want to see not just TPS move forward, but the Tulsa region. So I would encourage you to continue your work um, in education and with the chamber to make sure that our students are getting the things that they need so that Tulsa can be the city and the region that um, everyone in this room knows that it is. So, with that, I want to say thank you for allowing me to help you help students, and I really appreciate everything, and I am going to miss all of you. And I hope you'll join me. Thank you. We are really going to miss her and her family. She's been wonderful to have on our staff, and she's added a lot to Partners in Education, and we hope to just continue to build on um, many of the foundations she's laid. So. As you leave today, say goodbye to Heather because this is literally her last week in the chamber. When is the last day? Oh, yeah, you can say goodbye to Heather.